First of all, thanks a lot for, for having us here. And uh, so on behalf of the, the LAC collaboration, I want to uh, give our uh, our version of the feedback on the, the nice Pythonic tools that have become available in the Python Hub ecosystem. So first, I want to just share a, a brief overview of the data workflow within LATB as, a, as it differs uh, quite a bit, uh, I think, from the, the Atlas and the CMS workflow. So uh, we, we have quite a large infrastructure for the data processing. As you can see, we, we have our trigger, we, we do some things, sprucing, trimming, and skimming of these files, uh, and then output these into streams. And these move on to an analysis production stage, uh, which produces mtuples in, in uh, smaller file formats, which uh, analyzes then use in their, their user analysis. So even though we have uh, all of this large infrastructure, primarily in C++, we use some Python steering. Uh, there are many tools with the ability to complement the structure, uh, such as uh, things to, to do checks on, on different stages along the way here. But for the most part, I want to uh, focus in on the tools uh, that are used in the, the last two steps here today, the analysis production, and then finally the user analysis. So on slide three, I uh, just want to again briefly overview the analysis in LRCB. So our data format is primarily using flat and tuples outside of the physics application stack. And these are filtered um, on samples to create n tuples. And this is done in the past with individual grid jobs. So from run one and run two. And moving into run three, this has now been something that has become centralized. Uh, additionally, uh, Analyzers make use of SnakeMake, uh, utilizing to create reproducible and scalable analyses. And then also, additionally, there's been some efforts to get involved with the GitLab CI to run their analyses using the CI tool. However, uh, this comes along with some concerns with data access and caching, uh, and so this is uh, still a work in progress. Additionally, uh, LHB employs a lot of use of software environments to run the analysis. So in the past, on our interactive clusters, we were using, uh, abusing physics application environments and using uh, things like LCG views, et cetera. And then locally, people had ad hoc builds, some homebrew different things, and occasionally some system package management. Uh, and then moving on to the future for run three and beyond, uh, on our interactive clusters, we, we look to have version conda environments uh, installed on CDMFS, uh, and these can be centrally managed. And then additionally, uh, locally, people can start using conda and mamba with conda forge uh, to set up their environments. Slide four. So now I want to talk about the, the first of the last blocks uh, that we saw in the first slide. Um, this is the analysis productions within the LHCB. So this is a centralized uh, sample filtering uh, and it's to create manageable end tuples for the analyzers to use. And so on top of this, uh, the Pythonic tools are used in the checks and validations of this process. Uh, and so here I want to highlight some of the uh, tools that are being used. First of all is, is Uproot, uh, which has been highlighted uh, throughout this workshop quite a bit. Uh, for an IO for root files, uh, we, we see better performance than root zone file IO methods. And it allows to read the data straight into arrays and data frames which moves us uh, to awkward NumPy and uh, pandas. Here we use these uh, data frames and arrays to uh, use our physics tools to do some manipulation and handling before shipping out to the end tuples. Uh, these are flexible to use with Uproot uh, to change between formats during development. So if at one point you're using awkward and you want to switch to NumPy or something like this, it's very flexible, developers like it and they can make this uh, change. So the, the main feedback then from our analysis production experts uh, comes from the significant improvement in the reading of the files with Pythonic tools. So there's a huge performance boost when you're handling many, many files. Uh, and all of this comes additive together, uh, and you can have a, a nice game. Additionally, the Pythonic uh, data frame structures integrate very uh, nicely into other libraries rather than using uh, Roots custom version. And additionally, uh, there are some concerns. So there's some few missing functionalities, for example, uh, JSON serialization for his. Uh, but for the most part, these can be manually implemented reasonably, uh, and it's nice for developers to use. Uh, and then finally, uh, which will be a running theme throughout this feedback, is there's often a lack of documentation in some libraries, which makes things difficult. You either uh, then need to have some expert understanding to trawl the source code to make the changes or use uh, the tools in the way that you want to use them. Uh, which can then uh, lead users to basically not take in, take part in these tools if it's too difficult. Slide five. So first we have uh, up is a LHCB publication which use solely scikit-hep tools 
uh, for everything beyond the data processing stage. Uh, here we, uh, the uproot package was made use uh, for the interfacing with the input root files. Uh, and then for the histogramming, it uh, made use of the boost histogram library, which replaced all of the classic th star root classes. And the, the big bonus here was to have multi-dimensional histograms beyond 3D. Uh, here in the bottom, you can see an example of uh, one of these multi-D histograms where you have a uh, ADA selection uh, and you can make this ADA selection and then you use the other dimensions um, here, namely to take a look at uh, some of the fraction of the candidate tracks and its PT. Uh, and so this is very handy, it's very nice. It allows the user to keep everything packed into one place and not lose things along the way. Finally, for the, uh, now into the statistical inference, we have a, a, the analyzers made use of iMinuit, which is a user-friendly interface to Minuit 2 to process the minimization. And they were able to build the PDF uh, in Python using SciPy library components. Near the bottom, you can see the, the nice bit that was able to come out of this. Moving to slide six. So some feedback from this measurement and the tools involved from this uh, team. Uh, so the standard scientific Python stack uh, can handle quite a good portion of the analysis flow. However, there's still a need to splash from other HEP tools in to get a full completion. The Python tools are often more lightweight, for example, uproot and flexible, such as boost histogram, uh, than their root counterparts, which is uh, nice for designing an analysis. For the Python packages, they also have a, a often simpler uh, implementation and lower learning curve, which is great for uh, getting students involved in using these packages. So uh, here, I just wanted to note about 50% of LECB analyzers are using Python-based tools in their analysis code. So this is something that is uh, being widely used throughout the collaboration. Additionally, many users often try alternatives, but uh, in the end, they seem to fall back to Rufit for fitting needs, uh, when the other fitting tools don't seem to be quite as mature or, uh, enough for the non-trivial fits. Um, they try and use these packages, but then in the end, they fall back to Rufit. Uh, if it's not progressed uh, nicely. Additionally, uh, there is some uh, missing availability of uh, bootstrapping. Uh, however, this has been addressed uh, recently with a resampling package, which has now been added to scikit-hep. And finally, uh, the comment was made that the architecture can still benefit from a general purpose error propagation library. Uh, there's some development on the Jacobi library in beta uh, to possibly address this gap, but this is still something that uh, has been requested to have included within the ecosystem. Okay, now I want to move to the amplitude analysis tools that are being used within LACB. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the amplitude analysis are the most computationally heavy analysis within the LACB physics program. Uh, there's many tools available to fill this niche, but today I just want to focus on one, and that's uh, TensorFlow, which is an open source computing software provided by Google. It serves as the low level library to provide all of the building blocks to be used in complex fitting. Uh, there's a number of institutes that are actually making use of GPU availabilities for fitting, which uh, TensorFlow allows. Uh, and they're using this for fitting, DNNs, and amplitude analyses, uh, and are making a good start in this uh, GPU front. And so additionally, there is some potential to exploit the large LECB HLT1 GPU farm outside of data taking to be able to, to make use of the, the GPU accessibility for these computational heavy analysis. Additionally, I want to highlight the AmpliTF package, which is a library of simple uh, HEP applicable functions using the TF building blocks uh, to build upon. Uh, it has a simplified class structure, which allows for accessibility to the developers and uh, to be able to apply it to additional libraries along the, down the line. And here you can see a, a nice Dallas plot that uh, is produced uh, from one of the LHCB publications, uh, which makes use of this package. So the feedback uh, from the users of the uh, amplitude analysis tools comes from the, or it starts with a primary goal. When a framework isn't readily available that someone can just pick up and use, uh, we need efficient computation of the development with the trade-off between time to actually implement the code. Uh, and then uh, in additionally, the comparison between the processing time that it saves when running. So basically we want to maximize our time uh, and minimize all of these uh, different parameters to, to get the best result. So there are frameworks like ZFIT that do this. Uh, it uses an iMinuit minimization backend, a TF backbone, which is hidden from the users and is very flexible. However, uh, there are concerns. TensorFlow is heavy, not always uh, uh, hardware accessible to a lot of institutes. So we're continuing 
to look beyond TensorFlow for things like JAX, PyTorch, et cetera, uh, that are coming along and that, that may be available to use. And so with this in mind, uh, the, the big feedback is when developers are working on code uh, in frameworks for fitting and they're using things like TensorFlow, we want to try and focus and keep this as a building block and not a cornerstone. This allows us to easily migrate to some other computa computational engine in the future uh, and can keep things flexible uh, and makes for future advancements uh, simple. Okay, and then so as I highlighted uh, ZFIT, um, I want to look a little bit more into this because this is something widely used throughout the collaboration. It's a general purpose, pit, general purpose fitter, uh, which is used to harmonize workflows and include advanced functionality beyond what is provided by the standard Python tools already. It makes use of TensorFlow as a backend for parallelization and GPU support. And additionally, it makes use of Uproot, Boosted, Scram, and iMinuit in the same ways that is mentioned before. Uh, additionally, it makes use of the HEP stats package, which is used in conjunction with ZFIT to uh, expand the uh, statistical inferences that are capable of the package. So there's roughly about 100 users across LHEB and Bell2 uh, experiments making use of this package. And there's two primary uh, analysis use cases for the package. One is a simple 1D mass fit. The Pythonic package allows for very, uh, very easy implementation. And so those for a more simpler uh, fit are able to pick this up and implement it quickly, which is great. And on the far other end of the spectrum, uh, it's used for extremely complicated fits. Uh, it's extremely malleable and it makes for uh, many uh, possible fits uh, that become a, a bit too difficult with other fitting frameworks. And on the bottom, you can see uh, one of the, the fits that makes use of this, which is uh, this um, quite involved uh, uh, matrix element that's calculated in, in the uh, um, amplitude analyses. And so the, again, the feedback from the CFIT uh, the experts uh, comes again with a primary goal to have an accessible Pythonic fitting framework, uh, which is beneficial for both new and experienced users alike. It needs to be integrated well, or, or it is integrated well within the general Python data science ecosystem uh, and scikit-hep in particular. So there's a, a continuance to further pursue integration for plotting routines and different statistical treatments. Uh, some of this is done with HEPSAS, but continuing to move forward. Uh, and currently now there are some exotic PDFs which aren't supported. So here, uh, when this is the case, uh, it leads to users to have a potential to fall back to RootFit when their uh, exotic PDF isn't supported. <clears throat> And then one note again that was brought forward is that the package would benefit greatly from additional support and feedback from stats experts. So fitting is a huge topic with many different avenues. Uh, there needs to be support from the experts and the implementation of each of the specific statistic recipes. So either this comes in, in the form of the development itself or having uh, feedback on the development uh, and working with the developers uh, to get these things installed correctly. Okay, and then and now I want to move on to PID Caleb 2, which is a, a rootless particle ID efficiency estimation used within uh, the collaboration. So here we need some software tools uh, to extract the PID calibration uh, between data and Monte Carlo. Makes use of uproot and boost histogram uh, for the simple access to root files with Python and subsequent histogram. And again, makes use of the higher dimensional bidding. It also makes use of matplotlib and matplotlib hep. Uh, so again, has been highlighted a lot in this workshop. Simple plotting, easy installation, lightweight, uh, and then the MPL HEP to apply the LHB specific style, uh, just as being uh, done within Atlas, as already mentioned. Finally, it makes use of XRootD uh, protocol to be able to access remote root files with the Pythonic interface. Additionally, uh, it makes use of pandas for manipulating the tabular root data to vectorize the efficiency calibration. Uh, with the implementation of uh, uh, pandas, there was significant improvement over the previous C++ iteration, uh, and the primary uh, improvement comes from the installation. And on the bottom, you can see uh, a mock-up of uh, the, the nice results that are able to be produced by uh, matplotlib, uh, along with LHB style, uh, and again, making use of these multi-dimensional histograms. The feedback from the PID Calib users uh, again, it's, uh, Python packages are simple to install and lightweight. This is great, great for shipping to analyzers to be able to use the end product. Uh, there is some concern using large data formats for centralized calibrations. Uh, this can become costly. So uh, people are continuing to look for ways to cache between users to lower the overhead of these large calibrations. 
and again, uh, what is seen nicely uh, improved with pandas is the event by event calculation can become cumbersome. And there's a huge benefit to vectorization. And so a, a note for developers, can you continue to utilize vectorization within your package to uh, get these nice improvements? And uh, as has been mentioned before, the documentation is very good for some Python hub packages. And on the other end, very poor for others. So uh, in this sense, uh, oftentimes the installation and the implementation headaches that come with poor documentation don't outweigh the benefit of actually using the packages. So this is something to keep in mind as uh, people continue to develop in this ecosystem. All right, and now finally, I just want to highlight some of the additional tools that are utilized within LACB. Um, first is Particle. Uh, it's a simple Pythonic interface for PDG information. So it's extremely handy for analyzers with many decays to consider uh, in a single analysis. So for our case uh, in LHCB, some analyses utilize over 100 individual PDG objects. So getting the mass, getting all of the different physical properties uh, associated with these objects is really easy. It has a nice interface and you can get it directly instead of trawling through the PDG web page itself. Additionally, uh, some analyzers starting to make use of PyHF. Uh, so specifically in some uh, new rare decay searches are benefiting from this simple implementation to an ecosystem that often doesn't uh, use native hits factory or hits very much. So uh, for LHCB on our side, uh, it's nice for new users to come in and make use of this PyHF package. And finally, I want to highlight the decay language package, which is a visualization and manipulation of the decay chains using a Python tool. So uh, we often take the uh, .dec files. Uh, these are files that are the basis for LHCB Monte Carlo generation as the input. Uh, and users can provide simple but informative infographics describing their particle decays. And at the bottom here, you can see what one of those looks like uh, for a D star 2010 decay uh, and the nice branching ratios and the intermediate steps along the way of, of the particles that are produced. Okay, and now to Summarize everything in our feedback from the LHCB as developers and users. The first thing we want to highlight is we are developers. The LHCB members uh, play a really big part in, the, in driving the developments of the HEP software ecosystem on many fronts, and we aren't just users. Uh, we continue uh, the developing of the tools in-house, and this allows them to be directly applied to analyses and other LHCB-specific sp software tests. However, there's lots of room for more hands to continue to generalize these packages to be used within the broader HEP ecosystem. Additionally, uh, the standard tools, uh, standard in quotes here, seems to draw more attention. So there's a lot more application uh, to life beyond academia for those that are getting involved in these more standard Pythonic tools. Uh, and this tends to be uh, what newer students lean towards. And uh, to, to go along with that, uh, currently students seem to be learning Python tools in university classes. So as the newer students begin to use these tools in their university classes and they come into the research field, uh, the attraction to the Python tools continues to grow and is helping to grow the ecosystem quite well. And then from the user side, again, uh, to reiterate this point once again, it's very important that tools have relevant documentation. And additionally, there's huge advantage to accessibility if working examples exist as well. And along the same lines, uh, having availability of testing these tools. So we know within the physics uh, ecosystem, there's lots of different specific use cases. So having a test bed for, for a wider scope uh, is very valuable and is especially valuable for younger collaborators as they try to get involved and make use of different things. Uh, and additionally, uh, uh, one of the highlights of the, the Pythonic field here is that bug fixes are often implemented very quickly. Uh, and this is, this is great. And additionally, the installation is quick and simple. Uh, this is a, a huge bonus over some of the root software, which can become tricky and difficult, uh, especially in the C++ side. And finally, uh, as a feedback to the, the community, we, uh, which highlights a, a lot of the comment that Matthew made at the end of his talk, is new users can often be overwhelmed with the choice and struggle to know which tools to use. So uh, like this workshop, increase publicity, uh, can really help the users to make some informed choices and be able to know what tools are available and how they can apply that to their, their uh, analysis workflow. So uh, as, as a final point, we want to again thank and uh, all of the developers and point out that there's a lot of advantage of using these scikit-help and Python help tools, uh, and we ask that you keep them coming. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nate. Uh, this was a great talk, um, and it's great to see, as, as me being an Atlas member, uh, a bit of the LHC perspective, um, LHC perspective, and yeah, lots of great points on these slides. Um, do we have any direct questions um, related here to, to Nate's talk? Um, Matthew, please, go ahead. Hi, yeah, uh, I'll echo what Alex said. That was a really nice talk. Um, on the slide that you have uh, up right now, uh, I just had one quick question. Can you, maybe this is better left for discussion, but can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on uh, on this idea of like test beds um, for tools? Like, um, I, I'm just kind of interested as a scikit help developer, uh, kind of more what you had in mind there. Yeah, I mean, uh, for for me, I mean, the one thing that that comes to mind the the uh, I guess the broadest area that uh, something like this can be used is within a fitting framework, right? Oftentimes, you you have a fitting framework, and it, maybe it comes with one or two examples, uh, and you know, fitting is huge. There's so many different ways you can use fitting. So, uh, in in this sense, uh, having a more general way in in how to apply things, or or where users can really get involved uh, to be able to test different formats or different uses for things um, rather than, uh, you know, maybe some of the more narrow examples. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, off the top of my head, the one thing that I can think of uh, that does this quite well actually is the, the R data frame documentation where you have uh, a whole garbage list of uh, all of these different things that you can uh, try and examples and, and it's not just one use case that things get stuck into. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, we have one more thing from Lucas that we'll um, address, and then we'll move on to the next talk, which is: um, Do we have a simple Monte Carlo four vector generator for the K chains described in the K language? Um, if not, that might be an interesting foundation library or an interface of these DK files to matrix element codes. Yeah, that that I don't have an answer to, but uh, let me look here. Yeah, I think uh, maybe we save this for a discussion and I can uh, check with the experts and, and get back to you on that.